All right, everybody, welcome to the Hunter's Quest podcast. This is your host, Hunter McWaters, and it's great to be with you guys as always, and it is great that I can finally say that it is hunting season. So I'm leaving my house in less than two weeks for my first hunt of the year. If you're listening to this, you might be heading out for a bear hunt, you might be heading up to Alaska, who knows, but basically the best time of the year is upon us, and... Um, you know, even if you're not heading out this month, you know, September is very close, right around the corner, and I know a lot of you guys are going to be heading out in September, so we're just right around the corner from all this great stuff going down, so super excited. It's going to be a great year. Again, I hope you can follow along with everything I got going um, this year and in the coming months. Um, today, I have a great podcast for you with a friend of mine named Kate Small. So we talk about it a little bit in the episode, but um, Kate and her husband, Justin, have been around the industry for a long time. Um, It seems like from the beginning, I sort of started running into them at different events out at the Western Hunt Expo and uh, Total Archery Challenge events and stuff like that. seems like I'd always just kind of be running into them. And so we kind of became friends. And, um, you know, Kate and her husband are both excellent bear hunters, but they've kind of like developed this little like niche of wolf hunting and they've kind of compiled lots of uh, years and hours of experience of wolves and, and they've of hunting wolves, excuse me. And they've become really successful and kind of figured out how to hunt and to kill wolves, which is not by any stretch an easy accomplishment. So, um, Something that's pretty cool is they started what they call the Western Wolf Academy, which um, if you're listening, you can go and actually register for this event right now unless it's sold out, which it may be sold out. But um, this coming July, so a little uh, less than a year from now, they'll be having their second annual Western Wolf Academy, and they're going to teach you all about um, calling techniques, um, you know, finding wolves, a whole bunch of stuff that we get into a little bit on this episode, but um, you know, it's a great way to hone your skills as a hunter, to extend your hunting season. And the biggest thing is the wolf populations are out of control in Idaho and lots of places across the West. Um, the mule deer and the elk are really hurting because the wolves that were reintroduced are a larger sub subspecies of Canadian wolf. And they're just wreaking havoc, havoc, and they're way over objectives, population speaking. So we need to recruit more hunters to get out in the woods and to try to manage this population a little bit. So I am super on board with what they're doing. I think we need to get as many folks as we can in the woods and uh, and get people wolf hunting. So go check out the Western Wolf Academy. And uh, this episode is great. We have a great conversation. Um, I do got to say I had a little bit of audio issues in the beginning, um, You know, so the audio quality quality is not great for the first like minute or two but then it picks back up to the normal um it's not bad but uh just so you know what's going on there uh we have a great conversation about that about both of our bear seasons um and she tells me about a weird experience her and her husband had in the woods um in the beginning so uh, we cover a lot of stuff uh kate is super fun to talk to very uh, very knowledgeable about these topics so hope you guys enjoy this episode. Uh, I'm again, I'm gonna ask if you haven't yet, please leave me a rating and a review. Please share the show. That is the best way you can help support uh, is to share the show. And um, also, you know, if you guys are watchers of the Sportsman Channel, please check out the Hunter's Quest TV show. Which the best time to catch it this year is Mondays at 11:30 a.m. Eastern time. So that'd be 9:30 a.m. Mountain. Or Saturdays at noon, which would be 10 a.m. Mountain, um, on the Sportsman Channel. Um, other than that, if you could go, if you haven't yet, go over and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I would really appreciate it. And as always, if you leave me a written review on Apple, I will give you a shout out on the next show, and I will send you some decals in the mail. So, um, you know, I'm just gonna keep asking because, uh, like I said last time, you know, um, I work really hard to put out great content for you guys. Um, I'm trying to build my audience, and I think it would be super helpful and really the least you could do if you could just follow me on Instagram, follow me, subscribe on YouTube, share the show with friends and family, and leave me a rating and review. I would super appreciate it. And, of course, if you have Sportsman Channel, don't forget to check out the show. I spent a lot of time working on that. Anyway, guys, that's it for now. I'm going to jump straight into this conversation with Kate Small, and I hope you guys enjoy it. See you on the next one. All 
All right, guys, welcome to the Hunter's Quest podcast. I'm here with my friend, Kate Small. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good, good, good. And uh, we were just talking about, I just decided to roll it because I thought it was kind of interesting, but we were talking about um, like hearing mice or weird noises at night and getting freaked out. And I was like, I'm glad I'm not the only one because I felt like a huge baby this year during spring bear. I heard like a mouse or something and I was like convinced it was a werewolf like trying to come and like eat me. <laughs> and I looked at the night. We did a night lapse that night and I, I actually went back and looked at the footage to see if there's anything like coming around. But it wasn't. It must have been like a mouse. Or maybe you just didn't catch the werewolf. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, Yeah, I always get creeped out like. So I'm glad I'm not the only one. So have you ever had anything like just freak you out at night when you're out there? Well, one time, I mean, always because I'm a chicken and I watch all the horror films. And so yes. I'm always convinced there's some ax murderer that's just lurking around <laughs> going to get me. But one time it was during spring bear and we had just found a lion kill and it was fresh, still dripping. Oh, geez. Uh, but that was where we were going to camp. So we just... <laughs> set up and we were kind of by a rock cliff and in the middle of the night you just heard the rock sliding and I just knew it was that lion but I it just was. hid <laughs> <laughs> I took cover and just figured my little teepee would save my life yeah well it's they do like mentally make you feel better but they would not do anything of something to really want to get in there on you no it's true I I lived in Africa and during that time I went camping in the Serengeti and I was with this other girl and I remember her waking me up in the middle of the night going, Kate, Kate. And do you remember that scene from Jurassic Park where they're in the tent and the T-Rex sticks his head in and they're just like laying there staring at each other? It was exactly (laughs) like that, except with hyenas and they were in our tent. And so now i'm always very skittish so you woke up with hyenas sorry i'm tr- like I'm trying to fix my audio here but i got it so you literally woke up with hyenas sticking their face into your tent they were circling and you could see the just the shadows and allies oh my gosh. They, were, they were searching for ways in which really they could have just ran through our tent but luckily that did not happen yeah. and we didn't have guns with us because it was just not a hunting deal oh you had no guns that's even worse oh yeah i don't i don't even think you can hunt in the serengeti i'm not sure yeah africa's weird like i went there on a missions trip uh to uganda and um yeah like we drove through the country and this just speaks to like why the north american model of conservation works because we drove for like literally like six hours through the countryside and i didn't see a single animal of any kind like i was like you know scanning every field like ever the mountainsides like cause, you know when you're in america or whatever you you see deer and you see yeah. stuff i didn't see anything the entire time and it's because like literally for generations anything that moved the people ate I and mean, i don't yeah. i don't blame them for it because they're you know they're struggling and poor and trying to feed their family but um yeah wildlife like only exists in places where they are hunted yeah exactly it's That's crazy. Um, so we're anyway, we're kind of jumping in, but it's okay. <laughs> but um, what were you doing in Africa? I was, was just, I was working over there volunteering as a nurse. And so oh, cool. in Tanzania and I lived in Arusha for part of the time and um, worked in the ER. And then I moved with the Maasai tribe in the middle of nowhere. We were like eight hours from any civilization and I lived with them in their like dung huts, no electricity, no running water for a while, like two months or so. Wow. Okay. All right. So two questions. Yes. I'm gonna get weird right off the bat. Oh yeah. <laughs> First thing is going back to like the scary stuff at night. Idaho is like crazy Bigfoot country. Yes. Have you ever seen anything weird when you've been hunting? So I haven't seen anything or heard or anything and well okay so i haven't seen anything but we we have this joke justin and i between us and anything that weird that happens we just are like uh probably nothing and we just keep going on because if you think (laughs) about it you're running so we were what was it it was archery elk and 
we were just walking. I think we were heading back to camp. It was in the evening and it was a little chilly. And all of a sudden he was a little bit in front of me. We walked through just like this wave of heat. Like it just Whoa. hit us. And I know he felt it because he kind of stopped and all of the hairs on the back of my neck went up and he turned around and just said, and we like, it was like this sweet smell just was kind of right mm. there. And I know his alarm bells were going off because he turned around and just said, we got to go. And we just, it, it was like that fight or flight, like you got to get out of here now. Oh, no way. Like and he felt just, it so much that he was like, we got to get out of here. Yeah, it was wild. And I don't know what it was. Maybe it was us just being huge babies, but it was weird that we both felt it, both smelled it, and both had that sense, like, you got to get out of here. So you were walking along, drastic temperature change. It was much warmer, and you smelled a, like a, like a, like sweet, like... It was uh, like a sweet, like, musty. Oh, weird. It was weird. And so you both just was, felt something was off. Yeah. And so that was my, I'm like, okay, probably big. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I don't know, man. Um, I, I've, I've been looking into this stuff more and more lately. And like, I don't know, the more I look into it, it's just, there's, I feel like there's weird stuff out there. Not to mention you got, I don't know if you saw anything, but like last week there was congressional hearings with this whistleblower. Did you see that stuff about the no. uh, UAPs? Did you see that? Really? Yeah, there's um this guy called David Grush. I did And yeah, he's part of the he's a former part of the uh, intelligence community and it was him and then two Air Force pilots, you know, um c- under oath speaking to Congress um about you know, saying that they have crashed UFO crafts in their possession, the government does, bodies of beings um and talking about all the different UAPs they've seen while flying different missions wild stuff that's yeah. wild and terrifying but you have to think like why wouldn't there be something else right yeah, yeah i've always <laughs> felt like there was too like it's it's not that i mean it's it's crazy to me that like it's starting to be like in the mainstream not like just oh you're weird if you believe in aliens but um to me personally, like I've always felt like there was probably something else out there, yeah, you know. The universe is just so vast. Like we can't, we're not the smartest breed, obviously. <laughs> at least some of us out there. Yeah, <laughs> probably. You would not. think there's more going on, but it's it's crazy to think about, and that they're actually admitting things now. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I don't go too far into that. But last question about stuff: Did you ever see? Because I saw some weird. Um, we were there on a ministry trip, so we were, we actually were doing a conference on healing and deliverance. Um, and we saw some crazy, like spiritual stuff. Did you see anything weird in Africa while you were over there? No, I didn't. We went to a witch doctor and that was Mm. just really interesting, but I didn't see any, anything wild. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's, um. There's some interesting stuff that goes on over there too. Um, we we had a, a demon possessed girl, um, who we were casting the demons out of her, and I mean it. Th- this was a 13 year old girl, and there was like six grown men holding her down, and they couldn't. And then um, we were giving it commands like you know, like stop shaking her, stop. Cause she was like freaking out, like arching and stuff and trying to bite me and like growling. But when we gave the commands in English, she would stop and like do what we said, like put your arm down and like she would put her arm down. And then after the whole thing transpired, um, she didn't speak a word of English, but she was doing specific commands that we gave her in English. Uh, it was Wild. That's terrifying. And I yeah. I like love hearing about that stuff. I'm interested how prolific it is over there because I know working in the ER, when we'd have seizures come in, none of the locals would touch the patient because they thought they were possessed. Mm-hmm. And it's it like I'd find people on the sidewalk and people that had had a seizure and passed out 
and people just stick stare clear. So I'm interested to see, yeah, or would be interested to know like how common possession is yeah. over there. They see it frequently, and they're everything now is just like, oh, that's what it's got to be. Yeah, I think you know it's not everything. I think there are like actual like epileptic seizures. Not like every seizure is demonic or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because we saw a kid too that was having a seizure, and I actually like, I think he was just having like a medical seizure, um, but this one specifically was not. Yeah, um, that sounds. That's no seizure when they're fighting. Yeah, <laughs> and then like after it, yeah, and she tried to bite me and stuff, and then like, at, but after the, you know, after it was done and we cast it out, she was totally fine, normal, like mild mannered, nice little girl, because she was there at the conference all week, so I, you know, I kind of kept an eye on her, and. um there was another, um, there was another girl, young girl had a baby and she came up and she was asking for money and you can't really just give money to people because then everybody just comes up and asks for money and it's just kind of a weird dynamic. But it, like the, the actual locals were telling us like, don't, don't give her money. Like it's better to not. Um, but anyway, but we said, we don't have money, but we'll, we'll pray for you and stuff. And, uh, so we, we, put our hands on her and start and like as we were praying I looked down and immediately I just see she's urinating her like right there like I don't even I didn't understand at the time but I think I think that that was some sort of weird uh spiritual like attack on her or something it was very strange that's bizarre yeah <laughs> Oh man, crazy way to start this conversation, but um... <laughs> welcome to the hunting podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, people that my diehard listeners, I don't know what they think right now, but um, I have been kind of delving into some different topics lately. So, just uh, you know, you got to branch out sometimes. I feel like, and absolutely, it's it's my podcast, so I feel like if I want to talk about aliens and Bigfoot every now and then, why not? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but um. If you guys are still listening after all that, um, <laughs> I'm talking to my friend Kate Small, who um, it's kind of funny. Like I've sort of seen you and Justin around at different events and stuff. Like since I've kind of been at this, which is about two or three years now, but I've seen you at TAC. I saw you at Expo a couple times, and so um, I don't have a ton of like really close close friends in the you know quote unquote in the industry or like in the Western hunting world. Cause I live on the East coast and I only, you know, yeah. can make it out so often, but I feel like you're one of the folks that I've like interacted with several times. And I'd, I'd call yeah, you a friend. We did collide. We're just over yeah. the same spot. <laughs> yeah. I remember like, I think it was last year or something at attack. Like I was trying to leave and it started raining and I looked over and you and Justin were standing right there. I was like, Oh, Hey, yeah. we just kind of started talking. <laughs> <Wait. laughs> yeah. Um, but you guys have, so you're from Oregon, correct? Yes. Yes, originally from Southern Oregon. And, and I've said this a million times, but, like, there's so many crazy, like, bad A hunters from Oregon. It's wild. It's, yeah, I think you have to, <laughs> maybe Oregon breeds hunters because you have so much pressure, not a lot of animals, a lot of regulations, <laughs> and a ton of predators that you can't hunt. So <laughs> yeah. you have to just, like, climb your way <laughs> to be yeah. a predator. And like crazy woke opposition in the urban areas. Yeah. It's wild. I'm <laughs> I'm so glad I don't live here anymore. So yeah. are you are you guys did you grow up what did you grow up like in a city or what? Um no, I'm from Klamath Falls. So it's just a town. It wasn't it wasn't like the not a tiny town like I live in now, but it probably had twenty thousand people in it growing up. Okay. And we were, there was just nothing around us, so it made it feel a little isolated, which was nice. <laughs> okay. And you guys live in Salmon now, right? Yes, we live in Salmon, which is about 3,000 people, um, which it, we love, just absolutely yeah. love it. And moved there to be closer to public land, and so okay. it, was, it was a strategic move. Um yeah. Yeah, I was out there uh, this spring. Um, there was this really good, like, burger spot that me and Luke ate at, like, five times. In Salmon? Yeah. Was it Savage Grill? Yes. Yeah. Savage Grill. Cool. 
Oh, and their so milkshakes. Good. Tell me you got a milkshake. I didn't get a milkshake. Okay. Well, next time. <laughs> you have that place is so good. Like they have amazing burgers and sweet potato fries. And like we ate there at least, I think for three or four times. It, it's good. But I want to hear about your bear hen. Okay. Good segue. I want to hear about yours too. Um, yeah. You're kind of, I lost you. You kind of broke up for a second. You there? Uh oh, she froze. Let's see if we can get her back. Sorry, I was in now. What? <laughs> oh, there you are. There. Can oh. you hear me? Oh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you froze up for a second. That's okay. Um, So, yeah, I, I want to hear about your bear season as well. Um, That was. Okay what I want to start off with, but, um, I'll tell you a little bit about mine. Mine was, um, rough. <laughs> yeah. It was a um, rough year. I, yeah, I heard that from several people and I want to get you to weigh in on that, but I'll just give you briefly what happened. So, um, of course, you know, my season quote unquote, it's just, you know, a week or 10 days that I'm out there, yeah. but we, we were in the salmon area. Uh, I already kind of divulged that, but, um, we went to a spot that I actually e-scouted myself and, um, just the terrain looked really good based on what I learned last bear season, hunting with some better hunters than me and kind of just applied that to this area. Um, great looking area. And, um, but we went in and we were like, you know, it was really green but we we were like at like four thousand elevation range, and it it we were like you know way below the snow line. Yeah, I feel like it would have been like a really good spot like in April, but we were in like mid May, and um, but anyway, it looked really good. We went in there and we did actually see. I think it was like the second day, we saw you know one sow and cub pretty far away, um. But we actually made, in retrospect, which was a poor decision, and left the area to try to find somewhere closer to the snow line. Um, and, you know, if people want to listen, me and Luke did a whole full in-depth recap a couple episodes back, so uh, I won't go too into detail. But um, basically, we left a spot where we saw bears. You know, they weren't legal, but we saw bears yeah. and, and went to somewhere that was kind of more of an unknown. It was an area Luke had hunted before. And we got there, and of course, the river, or you know, the stream he crossed the previous year in like ankle deep water was like, like a, a raging river. torrent. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually attempted to cross it in my pack raft, and <laughs> um, I did. So the landing was about 10 feet wide where the trail was on the other side, and then there was just thick willows, uh -huh. like impenetrable. And I just drastically underestimated the strength of the current and just hit that thing and went shoop, and just got like flushed oh. and um, had to like, you know, go up to the will. It was pretty sketch. So, and then I could see Luke was like, kind of like, uh, and I was like, if you don't want to do it, man, it's, it's all good. And he's like, I don't think it's worth it, man. So, so I had to go back across again, but um, no. then we left. And then I don't know, after that, it was like, we were just kind of rebounding from that, probably yeah. that first mistake the whole time you're just bouncing around different spots and we kept hitting road closures or you know flooded streams or we would hit spots where um it seemed like it was either like 80 degrees and like summer or it was waist thigh deep snow like post holing through snow and so we had a really you know really tough time finding anywhere we finally got into like a decent looking area towards the end of the trip but it was the only two bears we saw the whole time. So we just, we hit like just tons of challenges and it was, uh, I definitely learned a lot, but it was one of the toughest hunts mentally I've probably ever done just hanging in there. But yeah, it's, it was a really weird year in the sense we had a ton of snow. It was cold forever. And then all of a sudden it got hot mm -hmm. and there wasn't any segue into spring, summer. It was just winter. Summer. Yeah. And 
that's what we faced. We had so much snow. Usually we set out a bait for friends and family. Um, and we didn't, set, it's the first year we haven't set one because we couldn't get to where we normally set mm-hmm. it. It was just the snow level was insane. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't even think we were going to get into our normal hunting spot this year because of the snow. Um, but we ended up making it and it was, yeah, like a weird, it was just weird. And the bears, I think they were confused by the weather <laughs> pattern. And yeah. so I think they started, um, the boars started chasing the sows pretty early this year. Mm. Um, so, cause normally I love spring bear, you know, you can pick up a bear, same spot every day. Yeah. Um, but this year they were moving, mm. um, uh, as I like to hunt mid, mid to late May, usually. Okay. May. And, um, yeah, they were cruising this year. So it was interesting. We went, it was me, Justin and, um, our friend from Texas who had never, um, hunted bear before and so we all went out for a five-day hunt um and our buddy connor from texas he was first shooter and it took a couple days to find well no that's like we had found a bear that justin has history with in one of these canyons Mm -hmm. and he lines up for the shot which was i think it was like 780 which is not like that's a normal shot for us um and justin never has any issues he shoots at this thing and i'm watching like you're high he shoots again like high and he's just missing this thing like Hmm. clean by a foot shoots again high shoots again high and bear's gone and he was devastated and he connor was gonna be first shooter but justin had had this thing for years with this bear where it would he'd be ready to shoot and it would disappear and uh, it you continues know, it, yeah it continues and so <laughs> obviously he's bummed that never feels good um and what had happened was Justin and I had gone in a day early to kind of scout and make sure we could get in there before our buddy from Texas came and we wasted one of his days and while we're walking in, I see elk up on a ridge across the canyon and there I, I like their behavior was weird. And I turn around to Justin to say, hey, they're looking a little spooky. And mm-hmm. right when I say that, I catch one sprinting down the hill and there's a wolf. Oh, no way. Sprinting right after it. And so they disappear into the canyon. And of course, our hunt immediately turns to a wolf hunt. <laughs> and um we wait a little bit we hear him howling down in the canyon and so we only had one stupidly one rifle with us so i was gonna sit back to glass while justin snuck down to see if he could sneak in on him we the wind wasn't great but we didn't have a lot of time left well justin's hiking down and falls and just nail lands like on the gun Uh, but we didn't think anything of it and (laughs) so then when the i think it was two days later he had that shot and we brought it back and checked it and man, that thing was off. Oh man. And so when you shoot at a longer distance, it's way off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and yeah. um so luckily when we had our friend from Texas, we had a backup rifle. And after Justin missed, we decided we probably blew that canyon out and to go hike up in a different um basin. And then we spotted a bear on our hike in the camp and it was um a younger bear but our buddy had already said i'm gonna take anything you know which yeah. for me it's a predator yeah i mean that bear is yeah. gonna still go after fawns it's gonna yeah. grow up it's and first bear i mean come on. yeah i was like heck yeah i'd take anything too yeah and um so he took it it was a gorgeous um black bear which where we hunt, I swear, I struggle to find true black bears. They're always well, color based. So he was pretty excited. So that was cool. And then set up camp, started glassing the first night in this new area and saw a ton of bears. And so the next day we made our way on this hellacious hike, um, like side hilling through the avalanche chutes with, mm. and I hate that with the snow and, you know, yeah. one wrong step and you're a goner um 
And then we got over there and a bear popped out and Justin was next in line to shoot because I was just going to be last shooter. And he was like, I don't know. And I was like, well, we came all the way over here. I know another bear is going to pop out. If you're going to pass, I'm going to shoot this thing. And so he passes, I shoot, bear goes down. I think it was like 618 okay. yards across the canyon. And so we were just sitting there for, waiting for another bear to pop out because we had spotted a pretty mature boar. Well, another bear pops out. It's getting late. Justin's like, I'm going to take it. So he shoots, hits it, have it on film. It's it's a dead bear for sure. We hike, I think it was 12 or 1400 um, feet of elevation down, mm. cross the creek, hike back up the other side, find my bear. Um, Connor and Justin leave me to skin it and process it while they go look for Justin's bear. And unfortunately, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you've ever looked for bears, but they live in thick stuff a lot of times. And they found a bunch of blood. They gritted the area and they could not find Justin's bear. Oh, they were catching scent and smelling it. And there were so many bears in that area that finding the exact tracks were so difficult. Yeah. Um, and they, it probably was, you know, 30 yards in a bush that somebody didn't crawl under. And so yeah. that... Justin had a rough time and uh, you know, that just kills you when you, yeah, you the know, worst. Something's dead. At least I know it was dead. It probably likely wasn't wounded, but it's just so hard as a hunter to one miss an animal to not recover one. Mm -hmm. And so he was a bit heartbroken. Um, but yeah, then we packed up and <laughs> hiked on out of there, which was not ideal. And a storm was rolling in. And then we spent the night and that was the end of our hunt. But we almost filled three tags in five days. And then, that's... but I was, our goal was just as long as Connor got one. Yeah. No, that's and awesome. So it was. You guys need to take me hunting. I know. We should plan <laughs> that for next spring. That would be I'd awesome. Be down. Yeah. That would I'd... be way fun because I love taking people to get. Yeah. Through. And I There's definitely have very... a lot to learn. Like it's this. This humble this season humbled me, man. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, uh, well, I had a really good fall. Every single hunt I did, we killed one or more animals, and um, that's awesome. Yeah, we got totally blessed, and um, and I don't know. I was just, I was just uh, a little, maybe a little overconfident, or I mean, it's good to have confidence. Yeah. But, um. And I think also last year when I went with like Mark and those guys, we saw a lot of bears. Um, like I even passed bears, which is I wish I hadn't now, but <laughs> You're like, Dang it. I know. But uh yeah, I don't know. I just I just uh underestimated. And like you said, it was a weird year, but um It was a weird year. And I mean everybody has those hunts. Like mm -hmm. that was your hunt to be unsuccessful. Justin, I can't remember the last time he's had an unsuccessful hunt and it was just, sometimes it goes that way. And yep. I think it, yeah, it's humbling and it's good to like bring you back down. Like, oh, this isn't that easy. Like you, you know, things yeah. there's a lot that can go wrong and it's always good to remember that and Absolutely. just feel like so you, blessed you, for what you, when you are successful. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, you can't be successful every time for sure. Um, but anyway, um, I, you said a couple of things I wanted to ask you more about. Um, so one thing was, I know the West had crazy amounts of snow this last year. Um, do you think that the bears stayed denned up later this year? I do. I mean, they'll come out in the snow for sure, but they'll come out briefly and then go back in, you know, as opposed, cause there's nothing for them to eat. There's no vegetation when it's all covered in snow. So I think they stay denned up, you know, they're looking and they're hoping, but yeah. they don't want to trek to find food when they've just been in hibernation for months. Right. They don't have the energy. Yeah. Cause man, we looked high, we looked low. We, we didn't see one boar the whole time. Um, now we did in retrospect, spend a little too much time, you know, being indecisive and bouncing around different spots. But even when we were doing that, we were like, 
you know, stopping the glass mountainsides and stuff. And, um, yeah, it was just, uh, it was weird. It just seemed like, like I said, it was either summer or like completely winter everywhere we were looking and we got into some really good looking stuff, but just never, never found anything. So, and then you were saying that, um, you felt like they started rutting earlier than the normal. Huh? Yeah. I feel like maybe they thought they'd end up too long maybe. And they're <laughs> like, Oh, we're late. But yeah. it was, to me, I saw more like rut action for them earlier than I normally do. Okay. Interesting. And so, um, and yeah. so as far as timing, like, um, again, I'm operating off very limited experience, but, um, the guys I kind of learned some stuff from, they kind of instilled in me, um, that like that, like mid, even mid to like late April is really good because like, like we kind of alluded to earlier, they're just starting to come out of the den. They're very much more patternable. Like they're going to kind of stick in an area and not be traveling a whole lot. Um, but this year, just because of schedules with my um, my partner, ended up going in mid May, and I was kind of worried that was going to be too late. Now I think it was actually fine because of the way the winter was this year. But um, you mentioned you like mid May. Yeah. What's what? What is it about that time frame that you like? Or well, yeah. for me, where I hunt, I can't get in really too much before mm. that. Mm -hmm. And so the snow level is just way too high. Yeah. And so I, I like mid May because that's where I hunt is where the snow is starting to mm -hmm. disappear and the green it's getting green. Yeah. And so it gives you a better idea of where to look for the bears when you have all the, the green yeah. vegetation popping up. Are you guys hunting kind of the, like that seven K kind of elevation range in there? We, we do. We kind of, it just depends. Cause I've seen, Bears really low, but I find the big mature boars like between that six and eight mark mm. is where I've mm -hmm. been. Yeah. 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 Like I said, I think that first spot we went into was really good. You know, it was really green. There was water in the bottom. There was tons of rocks and nasty steep stuff and, and lots of grass. And, um, but it was just, uh, I think it was just a little bit low. It's like I said, it was like 4,000 and, um, there was no water up high. Like they would have had to go all the way down to the bottom to get water. So I don't know. Might be worth going back to that spot though in mid late April. I don't know. Yeah. If you can get into it, I definitely would. And then, yeah, I've been hunted. I like, when was it? I think it was the year before last. We picked a new area to go try. We had mm -hmm. tagged out, but we had a buddy with us and it looked perfect. Like there's, if you had asked me, I was like, oh, we're a hundred percent going to see a bear. We were there for like three days and didn't see a single bear. Yeah. It was weird. And I don't know. I don't know. It's an area where grizzlies are. So I don't know if there's like mm. their black bears are scarce around grizzly territory. I don't know that much about it. Um, yeah. The grizzly black bear conflict, but I don't, I, it was interesting because the terrain, the water, the elevation. I was like, oh, there's no way we're not going to yeah. see. Yeah, that's how I felt. I was like, oh, there." I, I was. I kept looking at Onyx, like l like trying to disprove my East guy. Like this is not, you know, I was trying to like find a different spot. Every time I looked at it, I'm like, there's 100% going to be bears in there. And, uh, I mean, it was the only spot we saw a bear the entire week. So I was kind of not wrong, but yeah. I think we just bailed on it too soon. We were only there. Like we got there, we hiked it in the morning and glass afternoon and we found elk right away and some deer and then didn't see any bears the next day. We spent the whole day, saw that one sound cub. And then we decided to like the next morning we dip, I think we just dipped too early. Like, or we should have just maybe moved deeper in, in that yeah. spot or something. And bears, I mean, they're, you know, bigger animals and you think you'll see one, but I've glassed the same spot for like nine hours and not seen anything. And then all of a sudden a bear steps out from behind. Yeah. Them. And so there, they just, they disappear because when you're glassing across a Canyon, that bush is what you think is like a foot tall is like eight feet. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't see them. Yeah. So I, I definitely definitely uh, underestimated it but i don't know maybe maybe next year and come out you guys can teach me a thing or two yeah that'd but be but we'll see but um well cool um so, oh i want to ask you too about 
Um, so you like? Do you think like to you are jet black bears like cooler? Like, would you rather kill a jet black? I've killed. I've only killed one jet black, so I think they're super cool because I have a bunch of chocolate, some you know cinnamon ones. But I think I what I'd want most is a blonde. I haven't gotten a blonde bear yet, and yeah. so that's. Number so one. I don't know if you if you saw it, but I was filming for Mark Livesey last year, and he shot a blonde one. I got to watch the whole thing go down, which was really cool. See, I'm jealous. It was like golden, like I can't even. It was a really cool color, but um, um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say like out here. So we have bears in Virginia and uh, Eastern North Carolina. But they're, like, almost exclusively jet blacks. So, for me, like, I really want to kill, like, a, a cinnamon or a chocolate or something, you know? Yeah. No, I don't blame you. Well, yeah. Come to Idaho because you'll, you'll find one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I'll have to try again. But, um, so, anyway, moving on from that. I know we did a podcast, like, a mini kind of podcast at the Expo this year um, and talked a lot about wolves. But I do want to kind of revisit that just because Absolutely. you're kind of the wolf My favorite lady. favorite subject. <laughs> yeah, you're the wolf lady. <laughs> um, but what was I going to say? Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, but, yeah, so sorry. It was really good. I wanted to figure out what it was I was going to say. You're fine. No, it's not there. <laughs> um, so wolves. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, are you guys going to be at the Expo again this year? Yes. Yes, we will be. So. Okay. Yeah. Are you, are you going? Yeah. So I'm going to, you know, I got to be efficient with my travel here. So uh, this is actually cool. I'm going to fly out to Texas and do a free range Audad hunt for three days no and then way. drive to Salt Lake right after for the expo. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It'll be fun. It's a good trip. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, I got a couple like really cool, like little road trips. So I drew side note and, um, I, my goal this year was to kill my first elk and, um, cause I haven't killed elk yet. I've been on elk hunts filming, but I've never killed one. And so, um, I'm like, yeah, I want to kill an elk this year. So I put in, I got my Montana general elk tag, which yeah, is awesome. Yeah. But, um, somehow I just like, I, I was applying for, you know, like sheep and Barbary sheep and, um, you know, cool stuff like that in New Mexico. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I got to gotta throw in a elk you know application why not right yeah. and all the other ones i did through my friend um at blackhorn guide service you know because you get better draw odds if you go through a, a guide or an outfitter down there um but for whatever reason i oh because he said he couldn't do elk with me this year so but i was like i can't not so i just threw in i was just like randomly like what are some good tags and just threw, i drew this like amazing new mexico muzzleloader elk tag did you really? Yeah. So, like, my first ever <laughs> elk hunt is going to be, like, a premium New Mexico unit. Oh, my gosh. Tag. Yeah. What, se- <laughs> what time of year is that? What season? It's mid-October. Oh, it's going to be so cool. Yeah. So, it'll be a little bit post-rut, obviously. But I think from the guys I've been talking to, it'll still be um, still be some bugling going on. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I was saying that because I'm going to immediately the, – the season goes to the – 18th and then immediately driving straight up to Montana to hunt for like five, six days there and try to try to find a bull there too. So it'll be a cool road trip too. That's going to be, you've got one heck of a season coming up. I have an amazing season. Yeah. I'm leaving for Alaska in three weeks. What? Yeah. <laughs> what are you, what are you, what are you doing there? Oh uh, man. Um, so I apologize to the listeners if you guys have heard me say this a billion times, but um, we are going to the North Slope and we're um, jumping on an airboat and they're going to take us between 30 and 60 miles up the Ivashak River and drop us off and we're going to hunt and then we're going to pack raft float out. What are you hunting? Oh, caribou. <gasps> Fun. Rifle yeah. or boat? A rifle, yeah. Sweet. Oh, my gosh. That's going to be so cool. Are you excited? Oh, I'm so stoked. My first trip ever, uh, my first backcountry trip ever, which is kind of weird, but was in Alaska. And it was a walk-in, like, DIY caribou hunt. And we didn't kill anything. Um, So this will be kind of like, 
redemption. And caribou is like getting harder and harder to to hunt. There's that's what I hear. I need yeah. to, I've never been there, so I need to get over there before. It's yeah. Too- um. Well. So, if you want, to, if you just want to hunt Alaska, um, like sooner rather than later, you might look into Kodiak uh, blacktail. It's a super fun hunt. Okay. Um, pretty easy to get tags and and book that trip. Um, really fun. And then, but like most caribou, like you're talking about waiting two, three years to book. Like everyone's booked like years out. So yeah, I, I would do. I would start making plans now if you want to. Um, but how I linked this up was I called the guy and he's like, yeah, you know, we're booked till 25 or whatever. And I was like, well, cause normally they drop people off and pick them up and do drop camp. Yeah. And I was like, what if you took me up on an off day and you don't have to pick me up? I'll just float out. He's like, Hmm, let me talk to my partner. And they're like, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> that was sweet. So I had to talk him into it a little bit, but, um, but yeah. So anyway, back to wolves and I do have a wolf tag for, that so good segue yes um, <laughs> always have a wolf tag yeah well it, so a wolf tag in alaska mm-hmm. yeah. good because they're i feel like they're just less educated up there too yeah and so that's they're so story. smart i don't know how you guys do it so let's jump into this like you guys <laughs> have like consistent you know success killing wolves and they're so smart they're so elusive you know, I was hunting this fall in Idaho. We had wolf tracks like literally 50 yards from our tent, but we never saw them, never heard them, you know, nothing. Like, um, first of all, talk to me about, like, let's hammer home why people need to be killing wolves, and then let's try to get people excited about killing wolves, and then tell me how you do it. <laughs> yeah, so um, why you should be killing wolves. Wolves were introduced or reintroduced, however you want to slice it, Um to Idaho in 1995 by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. Uh, during what that was time, their reasoning for that? Do you know? Honestly, no. I they I think their reasoning were they're bringing back the wolf the wolf population. But what I hear from Idaho natives is we already had a wolf. It was just a smaller right, a smaller subspecies, subspecies yeah. right? Yeah. And what happened when they brought in these Canadian gray wolves is they wiped out the Idaho wolf. Oh, wow. And so you, we don't have that wolf anymore. Um, and they brought them back with a, the goal in mind. So they mapped out um, called something, an area called the Northern Rocky Mountain Population Segment. So that's Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, the eastern third of Oregon and Washington, and then a small portion of Utah. And in this area, when they introduced wolves, they wanted the goal to be 300 wolves in this whole area. Um, well, flash forward, the latest count in Idaho was 1,337. Oh, my gosh. So what they – and with the maximum carrying capacity in that entire area being 1,500, meaning if the wolf population exceeded 1,500, there would be a lot of livestock conflict – and then the ungulate population would start to deteriorate. Yeah. Well, I think this is our lowest wolf count in, for in the last couple of years because it has always been over fifteen hundred um, in the last few years. So they're down to one thousand three hundred thirty-seven was the latest count. Whether that's accurate or not remains to be seen because they don't count the Selway, they don't count the Frank Church Wilderness. And wow. they're basically just using, they don't do aerial counts. They're using collars and they're using a game cam, a camera system, but it's based off a grid. So they're not going to areas saying, okay, we know there's packs here. Let's put game cams up and we'll get on these wolves. They're going off a computer grid system. So these cameras will be wherever the grid tells you, whether that's the tip top peak of a rocky mountain where wolf's never going to be. Right. And so... Yeah, it's, I don't know why they do it that way. I know, I I understand the wilderness areas would be extremely difficult to count, but you can't yeah. really come out with a population number if you're not. So try was, to be accurate. when they introduced these things, was it, 
Oh, there's so many questions going through my head because I mean, anytime, anytime man tries to like fix something by introducing some sort of, it never works. And I feel like in Idaho, there's so many ranchers and hunters. Like, was it a big like deal? Like, did people get really worried and mad about it back then, or did they kind of sneak it in, or like what? Um, I I wasn't in Idaho at the time, and I was like five, but, um, <laughs> at the time I've heard from people that were involved that people were up in arms. Of course, you're yeah. always going to have the anti hunters or wolf lovers and that want the wolves back. And that being said, I don't want all the wolves gone. You right. know, I don't, I respect the heck out of wolves. They're yeah. amazing animals, but they do need to be managed because otherwise yeah. we lose all of our other animals, and then eventually we lose the wolves completely because they don't have a food source. Yeah, and it's not like, you know, an ungulate where it's a highly sought-after species in terms of hunting, and I'm not saying it's easy to kill ungulates, but relatively, like, you can just increase the tag numbers and you can see pretty much probably a pretty direct correlation, whereas, like, wolves are hard to kill. Like you yes. can't just like get rid of them. Like once they're there, like it's not easy to kill those things. And I think they're realizing, or they have realized now that their reintroduction was way too successful. And yeah. so, and left unmanaged wolves grow 40% annually. And so they're not like your other predators where a bear will have cubs every other year and, you know, one to two, sometimes yeah. three, four on rare occasion wolves have pups every single year um they will tell you that they're there's just the breeding pair that's not true they're dogs if the males smell yeah. a female in heat they're gonna if he can breed. get some he's gonna get some yeah exactly <laughs> and so they're breeding more than one female in the pack um their litter sizes i think they say on average are you know around six um well i've seen plenty that are more than that you mm -hmm. know uh, there is a buddy in Washington who came across, I think it was 13 pups in one litter. Ooh. And so, you know, they're just. Prolific. Yeah, they're just prolific. And so um, that's why wolves are so important to me when it comes to predator management. And I want my kids to be able to grow up and hunt deer and elk. Yeah. And if the wolves keep doing what they're doing, that's just not going to happen. Uh, we'll yeah, I talked to I've talked to like multiple, I have the luxury of ignorance of not knowing what it used to be like, but I've talked to like, you know, guys like Corey Jacobson and other dudes that have been in the game for a long time and just, um, saying how just dramatic the reduction in deer and elk is in some of these areas. Like you go into a basin here, like 20 bulls screaming and now it's like, you can maybe find one in there, maybe. Yeah, well, and it's changed the game for hunting, right? So the ungulates had to adapt. Now bulls don't bugle because mm. they know if they bugle, Gives away their spot. it's a dinner bell for the wolves. So, Wow. That's not so I think hunters have had to learn to adapt quite a bit to hunting elk. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So wolves are a huge problem and you guys have decided to do your part to not only kill some wolves, but try to start teaching people how to kill wolves. And like, yeah, like, how do you, how are you guys going about that? And like, how do we continue that to like encourage new hunters to get out there and, 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 and get into it? Yeah. So we're wolf hunting is kind of, it's a cool thing for people, right? For us, we, so you'll get a lot of like, out-of-state hunters like oh I want to kill a wolf and it's just like coyote hunting well it's not I wish it were um but it's not but for us we do it with a reason to save our ungulate population and so it's yeah. very important to us um and so we're talking with Tom Snyder from Stuck in the Rut he's a wolf killer and a friend of ours and we there's no education out on the internet to hunt wolves you know you can go find how to hunt elk how to hunt muleys how to hunt yep. white tail but there's not much out there in how to hunt wolves so for all of us for me justin tom and our other friends that are good wolf hunters and trappers it was uh learning by failure and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and all the it took years of experience and failure 
and time and days out on the mountain to start getting consistent and good at it. And in talking, we learned from each other. So we learned from Tom's failures and he learned from ours and mm-hmm. same with Luke Sterling. Um, he's a good friend of ours and we all kind of learned from each other, which was really neat. Um, but talking with Tom, uh, he was having some of the same issues we were where people were coming in because it's cool to hunt wolves, but they were just educating them, which yeah. makes it way harder for us to make a dent in them and actually hunt them. And then, so we decided, Hey, well, we're, cause it's, I don't know, for me, wolves, like I get excited to see anyone put down a big bull or whatever, but you're always mm-hmm. like, ah, oh, like <laughs> that's cool. I need to get something like that for me. When I see somebody else get a wolf, I'm so jacked for that. Yes. It's just, kill him. Like, Yes, I get them. And <laughs> and so people will say, well, if wolves are such a problem, why won't you tell me where you hunt so I can go hunt that pack? And it's because I don't want people to educate the pack I'm on. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. because once, usually a lot of times, if you miss, you're not going to get another opportunity. Mm. And we, I'd say it's an average of like 40 to 50 days out in the mountain before you can hunt, successfully harvest a wolf. Wow. And that number is getting smaller and smaller, you know, the more we learn and the more sure. we understand what their howls mean and their behaviors and patterns. Um, but so Tom and Justin and I decided we were going to create a wolf camp. Yes. Um, so it's called the, the Western, Western... Go ahead. Yeah, the Western Wolf Academy. Nice. And it's put on by Tom. This is your first year doing it, right? Yeah, it was our first Sick. year. It was so much fun. I, I was, you know, I, know, I saw the year. stuff on Instagram. I was like, oh man, I wish I was there. <laughs> I know it was a blast. The first year you're like, I don't know if people are going to like it. I don't know if they're going to get a lot from this. And you're always a little nervous. It went so well and we got Good. a ton of great feedback and people just loved it. So we are going to do it again next year. Awesome. Um, we're going to open up registration. I think this coming Monday, um because we like to keep it fairly small so people get that intimate one-on-one time with all sure. the questions they have um so i think we'll probably do about 20 to 30 people this year sure. um and so it's on we're doing it again at the longhorn guest ranch which is in cascade idaho it's a 214 private acre ranch mm. um all meals are included the ranch cooks all the meals you get to stay in cabins, um, these rustic cabins, and they have a couple of glamping tents. And then this year, we might allow some people to just bring their own tents or trailers and camp if there's en- more enough demand because we kind of cut it off last year. Yeah, yeah. So we decided, you know, if people want to come, we should. Yeah. And so you guys are teaching folks how to effectively hunt wolves without educating them yes because and granted you know we all make mistakes i make mistakes justin's making mistakes tom is too but if you can limit and diminish that um education portion you're going to make it better for the hunters and trappers that actually live in idaho and you're going to make it better for yourself yeah and so that was our thing is we're taking years of experience and trying to put it into a three-day course so we cut out, you know, five, eight years of learning for the hunters and hopefully they can take that education, go get one. Yeah. No, I love what you guys are doing. I think it's super important. And just like, it's already, it's already kind of got this cool, like mystique about like, like if you have a YouTube video where someone shoots a wolf, it's just going to like, I don't know what it is. Like. You know, Brian and those guys, like, they've got a couple of videos where they shoot a wolf, and that's, like, their most viewed ones ever. Um, now, probably some of it's, like, woke antis crying and watching it or something, but, <laughs> but um, no, but seriously, like, pe- like, a lot of people want to kill wolves, but like you're saying, they there's not really any resources out there on how, and I think, also, we need to get more hunters, like, on board with the re- the importance of trying to um you know control his population and like almost like change the culture of um like make it 
even though it is kind of cool already, but like it's almost like people are just like, oh, like it's an accident. Like I was out hunting something else, and oh, I yeah. saw a wolf. But, but like getting people to like value it enough to like go out for wolves. Exactly, and even in, like in the hunting community, I'll have hunters say to me, "Well, I'm a hunter, but I'd never shoot a wolf because you don't eat it." And that's great, but you have to manage predators. You have to manage everything. Yeah. And I mean, so let's I, just let's just put some good wolf recipes out there. Let's just go for it. I'll make some up. <laughs> <laughs> wolf jerky. Come on. <laughs> but, no, but seriously, I, I mean, like that. Like I, I'm joking, but at the same time, like that could be like, it, like if you can get people to value the meat, you know, like I don't have any problem. I would eat wolf. I mean, I think I, we talked about this last time, and the next wolf I get, I'm sending to you to eat. Okay. <laughs> because I won't eat it, but by all means. Oh come on! You're the wolf thing. lady. You gotta, you gotta like, you gotta <laughs> just start eating it. <laughs> what is it? Is it too them. close to a dog that freaks you out? Or it's if you when you walk up on a wolf and you smell oh, yeah. thing, there's no way you're gonna put that in your body. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never done that, but I have walked up on coyotes and they're very smelly. But there's other smelly animals that are good. Um, but anyway, but yeah, no, like. I, I cut you off. You were saying something. Do you, do you no, remember what you were saying? Fine. What was I saying? I, I just oh, think no. like even in the hunting community, there's just that educational portion of how overpopulated we are on wolves, how they're killing. Like, wolves, on average, each wolf eats about 20 big game per year. Whoa. But that's not including all the incidental kills. So they're chasing elk down, elk and deer, any ungulate, and the elk might get away, but it's exhausted and yeah. ran out of all its nutrients and just ran itself to exhaustion and dies. It's not including the spontaneous abortions of the ungulates where they're chasing a pregnant mom and the mom spontaneously aborts the baby. It's not including, so you think about a domestic dog laying there and say a cat runs by. Mm -hmm. It gets up and it chases it because that's what they do. That's instinct. Same with a wolf. A wolf is laying there and it sees some ungulate run by. It's not hungry. It gets up, chases it, maims it, and realizes like, oh, hey, like, I'm not hungry. And it yeah. walks away. And so that's not, we don't include in that 20 big game all the other ways they're killing For animals. For sure. And like, you know, if you ever had chickens... Like I've had animals get into my chickens and murder like all of them and like just leave them there. Yeah. So like you got to wonder how often that might happen. A lot. And not to mention now that we're finding wolves are running mountain lions off their kills. Hmm. And so the mountain lions are having to kill again and again because the wolf. And oh. so it's it's causing other predators to kill more, which. Yeah. Weird. It's, it's interesting. It's very multifactorial in how yeah. it's causing destruction. Well, like I said, I love what you guys are doing. Um, I, I'm totally on board. We got to get people excited about hunting wolves and, um, and, and the reasons why, you know? Um, yeah. so, okay. In a nutshell, and I said it's years of knowledge and I don't want to like make you re reveal all your secrets. So people actually will sign up for your, um, your thing, but could you give us a little, uh, little, uh, intro, like 5,000 level view of, uh, of how to kill a wolf? How to kill a wolf. Um, <laughs> expect failure for a very long time. Um, go into it respecting the wolf and locate them, number one, obviously. Um, easier said than done. Um, like Are you using calls in that so, phase? Yeah, I'll uh, howl. I was howling with my mouth to locate them. I like using for me. All right, you got to give me a howl. Let's hear it. No, I can't. <laughs> Come on. No, no. It sounds so bad up close, but it's when it echoes back, which is what I say about um, the Phelps game call. They have a wolf howler out. Okay. And I've started using that because for me, like I'm pretty small and I just don't have that like lung capacity mm -hmm. and I don't have that deep tone of a wolf. And mm -hmm. so that's helped me a ton, actually. Um, you could be like a small hot wolf. <laughs> they're just like, <laughs> and that's, so that's one thing is time of year. So mating yeah. is February, you know, mid January, okay. kind of through February. That's interesting. That's probably when like the easiest time for them to kill 
animals too, right? Yeah. That's probably why is because there's lots of starving and dead or half dead animals around. Exactly. And it's my favorite time to hunt wolves because they're extremely territorial during that time and extremely vocal. And so, it's not during any other hunting season. So that, cool. and that's kind of how we got into it as well as we were just supplementing. <laughs> yeah. Like our, our addiction to hunting. We we're like, well, what <laughs> yeah. can we do now? Yep. And it was, we started hunting them in the winter and now it wolves are now priority. Usually we'll, you know, we'll do our deer and elk and bear, but it's always wolf season in Idaho. So. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so where, like, I just want to keep plugging this cause I really want people to get on board. So like, where can people go if they want to sign up for your Western Wolf Academy? Yes. Western Wolf Academy, you can get a hold of myself, um, either by email at Kate small outdoors at gmail.com or Instagram. You can message me at Kate small outdoors or Tom Snyder. Um, you can just message stuck in the rut yep. and we're doing it next year, 2024, July 11th through the 14th. And it is demonstrations and seminars. And we have a really cool wolf course where we set up um life-size wolf targets and we put you in scenarios we've all been in so they're mm -hmm. real life scenarios and you have to be ready for it and we're using air guns and so you cool. run the course and it, it was a blast everybody had such a good time this year and we we timed one of them this year and made it a contest and it was so cool to see people just like we had them sprint up a hill bark uh, to what you bark to stop a wolf that's trying mm. to run away and then shoot. And so that was all timed. What does that sound and like? We teach trapping there as well, because it's, I'm not going to say it's easier to trap a wolf, but the success rate it's is higher. higher. Um, and then, yeah, then we talk, you get mine and Justin's perspective on hunting open country and we prefer winter hunts where tom is hunting more august in thick timbered and we go over different howls and what they mean and how to react to what they're doing and also That's wolf awesome. behavior and patterning them and which is extremely important when you're trying to wow so yeah what? it's it's fun yeah, that's really cool. It's like um, kind of like a specialty you guys are kind of working into. And like you said, um, not many people, there's not that much knowledge out there about it. And it's kind of, um, I think it's just interesting that you guys are able to kind of find that niche and, and kind of like develop that and, and then share it with others. Um, and it's cool. I mean, it's like, I think it's a great way to get like some really good hunters, you know, that are like just straight killers, you know, that yeah. like um, – that want to extend their season or really challenge themselves on something that's like a new challenge. Like, um, they just want that next level kind of thing to, uh, you know, once, once all the, the regular seasons are done, like just challenge yourself, try to go out there and, and do your part to kind of give back to yeah. the deer and elk and, and try to put some time in and get a, get a wolf down. Exactly. And it's, I mean, you brought up elk hunting and stuff and it's, it can be similar. You just have to learn what everything means, which is why the course is so cool. Cause it takes a while to learn. Mm -hmm. You're like, I've heard that how before, what did they do in that situation? And so I don't know how many times we all said, well, like when you're hunting elk and they do a roundup bugle and it's like, it's that how that that's what they're rounding yeah, up sure. their pack. And so it's just, yeah. it's, it's interesting. There are similarities. So if you're an elk hunter, you know, and you have nothing going on during the winter, it's a good, good time to hone in those skills. hundred percent. All right. Give me the bark that stops them. No. I <laughs> Come on. I can only do it out there okay. where no one can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then you got to go to the Western Wolf Academy if you want to hear Kate bark. Um, <laughs> so you said, so uh, last thing, you're from Oregon. I'm hunting Oregon this year. I've got to tell you. Are you? Yeah. Where are okay? Let's go over the states you're not hunting this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm very blessed. But yeah, so that's my um, my other trip is uh, is uh, Oregon blacktail because the uh, blacktail is the last like North American deer subspecies that I need to kill for the deer slam or whatever. Yeah. So and I just love deer and I love blacktail and it's like it's an over the counter hunt and it just and my buddy Luke is from he's from Oregon as okay. well so um so we're gonna 
tag team on that. Have you did you oh. do much of that hunting growing up? Um, no, I didn't start hunting till later on in life. So oh, I was that's right. 15. Um, so I really I only hunted muleys in gotcha. Oregon. Um, but I'm very interested. I want to. I can't wait to hear about all your hunts. We'll have to meet up at the Hunt Expo and just go over. Yeah, your absolutely. I'd be. It's, I'm. I'm already looking forward to the expo just to see, see folks again and and um, yeah, out here. You know, I don't. I don't have many people I can talk to about this stuff. You know, I'm in Virginia, so no, it's always a good time. <laughs> um. Okay. Cool. Well. We hit a lot of good stuff, and um, I usually try to keep it to an hour, but um, I don't know. Anything else uh, you want to mention before we uh, sign off here? No, I don't think so. Just it was thank you for having me on, and it was awesome yeah. catching up with you. 100%. Yeah. Um, again, I know I don't want to keep harping on it, but I, I really love what you guys are doing. Keep up the good work. We need to educate people on killing wolves and how to do it and how to do it well and effectively. So, guys, definitely check out. Kate and her husband, Justin on Instagram and, um, hit them up about the Wolf Academy and, and sign up. Uh, I think it's a great, great way to hone your skills, become a better hunter and give back to the herds. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. We'll talk soon. Okay. All right. All right.